And I have the pleasure to welcome another child sex trafficking survivor voice, Cheryl Cheeky, Executive Director of In Our Backyard. Cheryl, tell us about In Our Backyard and your work. First, I want to say thank you to Jocelyn and Centoya. Um, but Jocelyn, I just want to thank you for having the courage to moderate and host this event as a survivor leader also. Um, we're excited to just put this out. I'm going to be transparent with everyone. I, as a survivor, had to wrap my head around what was happening and being proposed. And I thought, who would I want to come and talk to and help people understand? And the first person that came to my mind was Centoya Brown Long. So I'm just so thankful that others are here to learn as we all um, try to just work together to make sure that our survivor voice is heard. Um, Inner Backyard is a nonprofit. I'm executive director, and we link arms across America in the fight against human trafficking through seven programs that educate, mobilize, and partner. And this is one of a um, perfect example of what that looks like. We are educating everyone on the survivor voice. We are going to mobilize however everyone wishes to get um, on our stance on this, that we are um, you know, to protect the survivor voice and also partner. And we have a beautiful partnership today with World We, um, the National Center on Sexual Exploitation and in our backyard and the Northwest Survivor Alliance um, and also our panel experts. But to keep this moving forward, um, I get to introduce our amazing panel that will help us um, continue this amazing conversation. So we have Elisa Bernard, um, Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for Thistle Farm. We have Yasmin Vafa, Human Rights Attorney and an Executive Director of Rights for Girls, and Esperanza Fonseca, Researcher, Writer, and Community Organizer um, with F Firm. So to keep this going forward, I get to jump onto the panel as a survivor. Um, Survivor-led organizations are important. In our backyard um, was led by, if you know her, founder and president Nita Bells and her book, In Our Backyard. It's the first book I read on awareness and education. And to see today that I get to take um, this privilege and honor to lead as executive director of In Our Backyard is the movement we wanna see going forward that more things are survivor led. So we invited, um, there's no one else I could think of besides Dr. Stephanie Powell to help lead us through this um, panel conversation. Are you if call you her? don't know her, she is, oh, sorry, I lost my phone. She is the Director of Law Enforcement Training and Survivor Services at the National go. Center on Sexual Exploitation. No. She has gained unique insight into the world of sexual exploitation and trafficking through her 30 years with the Los Angeles Police Department. Dr. Powell retired from the LAPD and Vice Sergeant and went on to serve in a leadership role at Journey Out, a direct service provider in Los Angeles. Dr. Powell joined the National Center on Sexual Exploitation in fall 2020. Her passion for education and her heart for community make Dr. Powell a leader in the movement to end sexual exploitation. So please help us continue this conversation. Please lead us. Dr. Stephanie Powell. Thank you so much. You know, and for the nonprofits that are out here and in, in, in watching us today, this really is an example of what it looks like to support survivors that are in the fight. You know, as survivors take the courage to emerge, you know, nonprofits have the ability to be there for them and support them and put them in the lead. So this is a perfect example of that. So I wanna thank you, Cheryl. You have done a great job of putting this amazing platform together. And as promised, we will now hear from survivors who will share their concerns about sex buyers, full decriminalization of prostitution, as well as its inherent dangers. But I, I just wanna remind everyone, this really is a sacred place. It takes courage to have these public discussions. Therefore, it is with the acknowledgement of their courage that we sit back and we witness their power. And who best to join them but the powerful human rights attorney, 
Yasmin Fatha. And so now we're gonna begin this panel discussion. And I'm telling you guys, you are gonna sit back and you are gonna hear the truth, no holds bar. So this first question is for all of you. We just heard Centoya speak on the topic of sex work being work. What do you think when you hear the words, well, sex work is just work. So whoever wants to take it on, we will begin. Alicia, you look like you want to start. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. Um, <laughs> so hi, everybody. My name is Elisa Bernard. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for Thistle Farms. And um, yeah, so when I hear the, the terminology, sex work is work, I, I think what it does is it normalizes and sanitizes the experience of exploitation that is inherent within the sex trade. I think that it kind of whitewashes the experiences of survivors that, you know, we've worked with for years at Thistle Farms and that I've run into in my own advocacy work recognizing that rape and sexual assault and physical aggression, physical abuse and verbal um, aggression and abuse are common in the sex trade. So I, I have a really hard time with recognizing that a job like any other has those prerequisites to be in it. You know, um, and I, there's a lot of people that not only on this panel, but they also feel the same way. And so Esperanza, we're gonna to go to you. And then I know Yasmin's gonna have something powerful to hit us with. So Esperanza, let's go to you next. Yeah, so I, um, you know, first of all, hi everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. And I'm really happy to have this conversation with you. As a transgender woman, a mixed race woman who comes from a mixed status immigrant family, I used to be very open to this idea that sex work is work until due to discrimination for my transition, I lost both my job and my housing. And I was given two choices, either to prostitute myself or to go homeless, uh, go food insecure um, and not be able to survive. And so when I hear sex workers work now, after I've exited the sex trade and I, every day I process what happened to me inside of it, um, it comes off as attempting to erase, uh, to sanitize or to scrub away everything that I went through, the women I know went through, and that the survivors on our panel today went through. A lot of things can be considered work. Prison labor is work. Uh, when we send California firefighters out to risk their lives to fight fires for a few dollars or a few cents a day, technically that's work. That doesn't mean that it's okay. And that doesn't mean that it's just. And I think we need to go beyond the question of is it work and ask, uh, is it socially necessary? What is the effect it has on women and girls and children in society? And is this something that should be preserved in our society. And I think for myself and all the survivors on this panel, the answer is emphatically no. Yasmin, what do you have for us? And then we'll go with Cheryl. Well, I, I think everything that's been shared is incredibly powerful and important. Um, just chiming in with, with some of the practicalities of, of the legal uh, realities, it, it, it doesn't even make sense. I mean, prostitution is fundamentally incompatible with work. I think for much of the reasons that Elisa and Esperanza shared, um, the reality is that much of the essential job duties that are required of prostitution, most workers are protected from. So things like being, uh, you know, solicited for sex acts, roped, um, any of those types of sexual advances are a violation of sexual harassment and discrimination law in, in a typical employment context. Um, we've had this looked at by several international partners and organizations. Uh, just a couple of years ago, there was uh, a statement put out by a number of the largest leading labor unions globally basically declaring that prostitution is fundamentally incompatible with work because of the essential duties that are required of individuals who are being prostituted. And so I think it's really important to realize that um, just from the, the realities of, of what is expected in prostitution and in terms of what sex buyers expect. Um, there's a lot of racialized discriminatory uh, expectations that again are fundamentally incompatible with uh, any other workplace, right? There's racialized tropes and discrimination, age discrimination, all of those things are protected 
uh, in the employment context. So it's just nonsensical in my view. And you know, it's a mantra that we're hearing often from very privileged people who never have to exist in prostitution. So um, that's where I'll leave it. <laughs> I know, because look, that's a whole nother workshop, isn't it? <laughs> you know, um, and we're going to talk about the inherent dangers as it pertains to, to prostitution. But before we go there, Cheryl, what would you like to add in terms of the normalcy? Because we had some conversations earlier of what happens in terms of when we start to see these things as being normal and places where that normalcy starts to appear. Yeah, so our culture already normalizes sex, right? And the sex industry. And that's exactly what exploited me as a child. Um, it was normal for a family to exploit me and sell me to other boys and men because as, as a young woman, I'm supposed to want it, right? I should like what's happening to me. So there is a survival that was happening in my life and many others of what's called sexual abuse. And there's also something out there called power of abuse. And this will only empower that abusive cycle. Um, we're only giving more power to those who exploit by making sex work real work. Um, so when I hear that sound, um, I cringe, I shudder because I understand the dark side of it and it has nothing to do with a stigma. It has to do with pain and violence and assault that I endured and I have no negative stigma about it. And that's why I sit here today to say it needs to be prevented and it needs to be stopped. Cheryl, was it you or was it someone else that was talking about um, how they will have like career job fairs? Was that you that, that spoke about that? I, I actually think it was Esperanza. Was it you, Esperanza? Can you tell the audience about that? Because, you know, that developed a whole conversation for us as we were preparing for that. So can you share that with the audience? Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, absolutely. So I was uh, quite disturbed to see earlier this year, my friend who is a law student at a university in Canada, send me a uh, sex work uh, exploration week in which uh, students, both undergraduate and graduate students, were exposed to a week-long uh, sort of programming about exploring the sex industry. And I think that it is so dangerous when we begin to sanitize what's really going to happen to you if you go into the sex industry, as well as what happens to women who don't have a choice, women who are not so-called economically independent and who are forced into it. And a lot of these uh, young girls, whether they're in Canada, whether they're in the US, are getting told that the sex industry is a job like any other. And if there was one thing I could say to my younger self or to other younger girls is that it's not. Uh, it's a place where women, where trans women, marginalized people, where we go to experience some of the worst forms of male sexual violence and sometimes, oftentimes, even death. Thank you. Thank you so much, because you know what, what it really shows is what it would look like under a legal system, right, that, you know, it would be proposed at, at job fairs. Um, my next question does deal with the inherent dangers. So because of the inherent dangers of prostitution, is it possible to really regulate that violence away from the sex work narrative? But before I have you answer this, that question, there was, we had discussions about this. Uh, in terms of terminology. So I just wanna do this disclaimer really quick. So you will hear me use the word sex work. You will hear me use the words prostitution uh, during this conversation. And I know there are some that um, agree with this language and there's some that don't agree with this language. So in order for, and then there's some that are hearing all of this for the first time. And so I'm just um, want to make sure that we are inclusive. So I want you guys to talk to me and, and I'll start with um, Cheryl on, on this one. I'm sorry, I'll start with Alicia on this one. Sure. Um, talk to me about what are the inherent dangers and the inability or ability, which I already kind of know where you're gonna go with this, to regulate the violence out of sex work. Yeah, so I actually think it's impossible to regulate the, the violence out of this problem. 
Um, you know, this is a social issue that is hugely um, impacting specifically marginalized women within our community. And when we sanction and, and condone the sex trade, we're essentially condoning the violence against marginalized people. And I think that that's a hugely damning uh, thing for our future. What I'll say is that, you know, when we talk about regulating just the sex trade, we're not talking about how the sex trade impacts not just the women within the sex trade and the people within the sex trade, but all people within that society and culture. So for example, if you are working in a place, if you are living in a place where uh, prostitution is legalized and you are a woman that is an accountant, but you live on the east side of, of a red light district and you have to travel through it to get to your job on the west side of the district, you are going to experience violence and oppression just walking down the street. You know, other examples of this are things where, um, you know, could you lose your unemployment insurance if you do not accept a job um, under a brothel? And so, you know, is that not truly violence in the sense that we're condemning people to poverty or prostitution? And I don't think that that's a viable option at all. So I don't really think you can regulate the violence out of this, especially when it's based so firmly in the oppression of marginalized groups, the you know commodification and um, capitalism on women's bodies for men's sexual gratification. I just don't think it's possible. You, you, you know, Alicia, I really like the way that you wove in, you know, because some people will say, okay, so what's the big deal? It doesn't really affect me. But I like how you wove it in in the fact that it could affect everyone. So we'll go Cheryl and then Yasmin. I was so captivated by Elisa's answer. I know. I was listening to it. So you gotta ask me that again. Um, okay, well, do, it's about, um, so just talk to me about what are the inherent dangers? And, and we talked a, a little bit about it already, but do we really have the ability to uh, 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 regulate violence? out of sex work? There's a gap of, um, I would say, of power, especially for the marginalized that I am severely um, concerned with. Uh, from my own privileged standing, um, in my story, I wanted to grow up and be a doctor and strip on the side. That was my plan um, because I could I felt comfortable enough where I could maybe enter the sex industry for, for commercial sex and, and thrive, correct? But what opened my eyes was um, really getting to know other people in my local area um, who were uh, in, in the survival aspect, um, those who were in gentlemen's clubs who weren't the highlight of the day, um, who were, um, violently assaulted if they weren't, you know, bringing enough home to make it, and just a lot of um, struggle. And I couldn't understand, right, I couldn't, um, that difference. And I started to learn about even, you know, the foster care system. And I just started to see the difference between my choice to think the sex industry was a good idea versus others who don't maybe look like me. Um, there's such big uh, gaps in social equity and race that I feel like my only behalf is that I witness it and um, not on my watch would I want something that would um, create violence in that, in that sense. And anything we can do um, to help showcase that how violent it already is and even our best efforts to regulate, uh, we still have bigger issues um, to face. You know, it's, it's, you know, the, the thing that you said as you were, were beginning this is you talk about the reasons why you wanted to be a doctor and a stripper. And it was because of the trauma and the experience that you had, you know, as a child, right? And that's why it's so important for us as we are talking about uh, the effects that it has on children that are forced into uh, the sex trade and how that even continues in their decision and trauma as, as adults. So um, Yasmin, tell us what you think about this. Tell us what you think. Can we regulate? Can we regulate violence out of, the, out of sex work? I mean, I, I certainly don't think so. And I think we already have evidence of that from the multiple jurisdictions that have attempted to regulate the sex industry through legalization or through full decriminalization. Um, we can look to Nevada 
and the legalized brothels there. I mean, Nevada consistently ranks top in the country for, you know, homicide, domestic violence related homicides. I think 48% of women in Nevada have been raped. Um, it's one of the top 10 uh, states for child sex trafficking and exploitation. Uh, I think the reality is to legitimize and regulate the sex industry is to breed more violence and the normalization of uh, objectification and other types of harm. We can look to Germany and the Netherlands and everything that, that is happening there. Those countries have very high numbers of women who are uh, in prostitution who are killed in the brothels. Um, you know, their attempts at regulating under a legalized regime are banning pillows from the you know 12 story brothels in Germany. I mean, it's it's inherently violent because men who seek to purchase sex from people they know don't want to have sex with them um, is, is an inherently a violent act. Um, this is essentially you know, exploit, exploitation in every single instance. And we know from the data that's available and we know from the survivors that we've talked to here and across the, the globe that in every instance, it causes uh, psychological and long-term trauma. And so I don't think you can regulate that. And really the question should be, um, you know, why, why would we stop at reforming what we know is a harmful, traumatic, and violent industry? We should really be striving uh, to eliminate the harm entirely. Yeah, and, and absolutely. Um, you know, when you talk about, you know, Nevada, when you talk to, you know, I have the privilege to talk to uh, some women that were working in the brothels, um, and when they talked about the trauma and the things that they had to go through, um, speaking to them, if I close my eyes, the trauma was no different than if I was talking to somebody in a legal system or an illegal system. It's all still there. Esperanza, take us home with this one. Yeah, so I would agree with everything that these other panelists have said. You cannot regulate violence out of an industry that is formed on violence. I mean, prostitution started in women's slavery in ancient society. And ever since then, the majority of women in prostitution have all been there because of coercion or because of force. And in every single legal context, they all experience violence, coercion, um, and in particular, sexual violence and rape. I also want to bring attention to the fact that it is not simply about can we regulate violence out of the sex industry, but it's also that this new approach to decriminalizing pimps, brothel owners, and sex buyers is also a form of deregulation, right? And what they want to do is to put uh, the bodies of women, our bodies, uh, on the free market and hope that the invisible hand of the, the free market is going to somehow keep us safe. And it's not. Uh, we cannot regulate violence out of the sex industry, but we cannot also deregulate it and expect it to make us safer. You know, Esperanza, you always bring it home. I'm telling you, you know, there's a part of me that wants to go, yes, but I know I'm not supposed to do that because I'm supposed to be the moderator. So having said that, Alisa, we're gonna go with you first. What is a myth you hear around discussions about prostitution and sex trafficking? Oh, that's a great question. And, and yes, that's a, Esperanza is always a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, so I, I think, well, there's two things I wanna address with this. Um, first, there is this myth that somehow you can demarcate, you can say, sex trafficking is over here and prostitution are over here. And these are two very entirely different things and there between the two shall meet. And I think that that is a very dangerous myth that I think can cause a lot of damage. Um, you know, ultimately the, the demand for commercial sex is not a demand for trafficked sex. It is a demand for sex. And so when you increase a demand in a certain place, the prostitution has to um, increase to meet that demand and therefore trafficking will increase because there aren't enough willing bodies to enter the sex trades that trafficking is always going to follow. So prostitution and trafficking have this intrinsic link that we cannot demarcate between the two. We have to acknowledge that to address one, we have to address the other. And I think um, there's another thing I want to uh, address and simply because uh, Sintoya had 
I appreciate the nod to Thistle Farms. Um, what I'll say is that uh, one of the things I think that there's a myth around specific the equality model or the Nordic model is that we focus only on criminal justice. That it is, we, we want to decriminalize the people in prostitution and we want to criminalize the buyers, pimps, traffickers, et cetera. That's true, but there are two additional prongs to the equality model that I think kind of get all left out of the picture sometimes. And those two prongs are education, which goes to general public, it goes to uh, sex buyers, it goes to prostituted people, it goes to young women, and it goes to young men. So that's education around the harms of prostitution, gender socialization, mutuality, and consent. But then the other prong that often gets left out is the services prong. And that is an essential prong, and that goes to exactly what Santoya was saying, is that just because you can make money in prostitution is not an excuse for prostitution. That's an excuse for better systems of equality and specifically economic equality. So providing harm reduction services for people who, whose, whose pimp is poverty and providing exit services so that people who want to and can get out safely can do that. So I think what I'll say is there's two myths I'll address. Prostitution and trafficking are intrinsically linked. And the equality model is a much broader model than I think the pro full decriminalization people let on. Thank you so much. I, and and I, I totally agree with you. Um, please describe what, what's an alternative. So what is an alternative to fully decriminalization of sex work if we really want to address the violence and exploitation? You touched on it a little bit, but do you wish to elaborate a little more? Sure. Um, so I think that, that in my opinion, and this is my personal opinion, I will say, um, we have not set a policy priority for this yet. And I just want to be very clear about that, that this is my opinion as a survivor leader, is that the equality model is the way to go with this. Um, the equality model, like I said, is a three-pronged model, and it addresses um, the kind of continuum of violence and specifically the gender-based violence that is prostitution and exploitation. It decriminalizes the people within prostitution that are selling sex of their own bodies, whether that be um, through an escort agency or through survival sex. It criminalizes sex buying, brothel keeping, managing, um, pimping, trafficking, all of those things, while providing full spectrum services that range from exit, uh, from harm reduction all the way to exit, acknowledging that some people, their best option of many awful options is prostitution and we want them to do it safely, but we wanna give people who can exit and want to exit the option too. And then the last prong is making sure that we have a full, very full fledged out um, education system, which is talking about prostitution, the harms of prostitution, but it's also going a little bit further than that. And it's teaching our young boys to become good men, our young girls to become empowered women. It's talking about the intrinsic relationships between this. And in countries that have enacted this, like Canada, there have actually been studies that have shown that this model is quite effective. Thank you. And you know, before I move on to you, Yasmin, I, I just want to um, say that even though we're being very gender specific in terms of women and girls, you know, it, it I, 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 and I know what I'm about to say, not only the panelists, but most people on this um, uh, uh, call, acknowledge the fact that this also affects men and boys as well. So although we're being gender specific and saying women and girls, we all acknowledge, and we are all also talking about um, men and boys. So we're talking about all survivors that have been sexually exploited. So yes, I'm going to move to you. Proponents of full decriminalization often is, insist that it has nothing to do with trafficking, but is that really the case? And can you also feed into that? How does full decriminalization impact sex trafficking? Sure, I mean, this is something that comes up a lot. And um, in DC, when we were grappling with our own full decriminalization proposition, this came up consistently. Um, you know, supporters of full decrim will say, you know, we agree trafficking is terrible. We're not touching any of the trafficking statutes. We're just focusing on, you know, adult consensual sex is what they'll say. However, as Elisa, I think really powerfully pointed out, there uh, is an overlap between uh, sex trafficking and prostitution. Uh, some of the ways that I think survivors have really, uh, you know, 
tried to clarify is, is, is that sex trafficking is the means, but the sex industry and prostitution is the ultimate end, and that these two things are happening within the same ecosystem. So we have to understand the policies that we devise impact one another. Um, and so one of the key ways that full decriminalization impacts and actually increases sex trafficking is that it decriminalizes or repeals all of the prohibitions against sex buying. And so I think as we've alluded to, sex trafficking exists, right? In, in basically every community throughout the country. And that's despite the fact that it is prohibited to buy sex virtually in every single state. So despite the fact that it's already illegal, we have enough, mostly men, right? Are perfectly content to break the law that we never have enough supply to meet that demand. And so that's why sex trafficking already exists because we already have a problem with supply. So to green light the act of sex buying by repealing those prohibitions would just you know, expand the industry even further. And again, we have evidence that this already happens. We have research and, and su that supports uh, this argument. But we know that sex buyers then come from neighboring jurisdictions through sex tourism. We know men who were uh, initially deterred by the illegality enter and become new clients. And as a result, the uh, demand for commercial sex explodes and that increases sex trafficking, right? Because traffickers are always incentivized to meet that never ending demand with vulnerable uh, people and vulnerable bodies, oftentimes children. Um, and so that's one key way that full decriminalization inevitably increases and expands sex trafficking. The other key way that it impacts sex trafficking is that it repeals uh, the prohibitions against pimping, procurement, pandering, promoting prostitution. So all of those state-based statutes that we have that are used to hold uh, third-party facilitators, exploiters accountable are then removed from the books. And so uh, the important reality is that in most states, the majority of sex trafficking and even child sex trafficking prosecutions are um, prosecuted under these statutes because as, as many of us who work on these issues know, sex trafficking cases are incredibly difficult to bring. Um, those charges can be incredibly you know, labor intensive. Um, they're not victim centered. They often rely exclusively on survivor testimony uh, and cooperation. Um, they can be very, very difficult and intensive charges to bring. And so in many states, uh, child sex traffickers and sex traffickers are actually uh, pled down to pimping and, and pandering and procurement statutes. So by removing this whole category of laws, we are removing really important tools to hold these individuals accountable. And um, at a time when we're already augmenting demand, right? So it's really important to just not be fooled by those arguments because it absolutely impacts sex trafficking in, in numerous ways uh, when we repeal the laws against pimping, pandering, and purchasing. Thank you so much. You know, um, I liked how you touched on demand a little bit because, you know, the, the focus should be more on demand reduction. And I know that's one of the things that the National Center on Sexual Exploitation is focusing on as well. And in speaking to law enforcement officers just this morning, uh, pushing that focus on that demand piece. Um, and then so that you guys know, and I probably should have uh, said this before, uh, at the end of this panel, we are going to hit some of the questions and answers that you pose. And if we don't get to those um, live, we will actually be answering those um, later on uh, throughout the day. So Yasmin, you're a civil rights attorney and have addressed racial issues pertaining uh, to the disparities in human trafficking. And I know that your organization, Right for Girls, you know, you're always talking about this and you are always um, putting up studies and, and articles um, on this. So can you speak about the racial disparities in human sex trafficking? And in your answer, include the history of Oregon particularly um, Portland as it pertains to race? Sure, I mean, I think anytime we talk about the sex trade or sex trafficking, um, we can't really have that conversation without talking about uh, systemic racism and racial disparities uh, and the overrepresentation of women and youth of color, including gender expansive uh, LGBTQ people of color who are 
grossly overrepresented in the sex industry, whether we're talking about, you know, the sex trade, prostitution, sex trafficking. Um, you know, we've, we've collected this data from a number of jurisdictions, and I think it's safe to say that anywhere you look, uh, women and children of color are overrepresented amongst individuals in the sex trade. And in most jurisdictions, uh, the majority of sex buyers tend to be white, uh, middle class men of means. And so we have all kinds of fact sheets you can check out on our website that really tracks this information. But I think in places like Oregon and, you know, Portland, Multnomah County, we really have to drill down on this because it's important to understand that we can't really talk about the sex trade today without understanding it in, in the context of a longstanding legacy of sexual and gendered violence and racialized violence in the United States. As Esperanza noted, you know, this, this has been hundreds of years in the making, the normalization of black and brown uh, female bodies as property for white male profit and pleasure in many cases, right? First through colonization, then through the institution of slavery. Um, in places like Multnomah County, for example, we know that girls uh, and young women of color are overrepresented among sex trafficking survivors. Um, you know, Black people are less than five, I think almost 6% of the population in Multnomah County, yet there are 27% of the sex trafficking survivors. Native Americans are less than 1% of the population here, but are again, over 20% of the survivors. And yet, you know, white survivors are around 20%, yet they're 80%. Um, so they're, they're even underrepresented amongst the survivor population. And that's very significant when you look at the history of a place like Oregon, that was a white only state, that when it entered the union, it was um, excluded black people, it discouraged Chinese immigration, it has had very, um, troubling and racist policies and attitudes for many, many years um, that carry through in the culture. And I think if you talk to many people of color in Oregon, even in places like Portland, that is still, I think, considered the whitest, largest city in the United States, we really have to grapple with these racial disparities um, and, and the injustice that comes from uh, an institution like the sex trade. And so really having to interrogate that when we see efforts by uh, outside organizations or very wealthy uh, you know, billionaires at being financing the legalization or full decriminalization of the sex trade in a state like Oregon, when it has that history and when we know who is going to be disproportionately impacted. It just cannot be ignored. That's the thing, and thank you so much. And we're not picking on Oregon. <clears throat> but because later on, you're going to hear more tie-ins uh, as it pertains to Oregon um, and, and the legislative things that are, that are um, coming ahead. So Esperanza, Centauri was asked the question um, surrounding the idea of two consenting adults and the proposed rights of their bodies to engage in, um, in sex acts. How does this disproportionately impact black and brown youth and those that are most vulnerable? Yeah, so the first thing that I want to say is that I actually do not believe that it is between two consenting adults. I believe this is a narrative that has been pushed by the pimp lobby and by their ideological support group, uh, the mainstream media, in order to justify our sexual exploitation. Consent has no meaning if you separate it from the broader social and economic structure of society. Uh, you cannot consent when you are being economically forced into having sex. That is not consent. Um, and we know that the majority of people in the sex trade are there because of economic and social coercion. Those of us who sit at the deadly intersection of racism, sexism, transphobia, misogynoir, and class oppression, it's those of us who are pushed into the sex trade. That is not the kind of atmosphere which allows Con real consent to happen. Um, and then the, the second thing I want to say before I answer the particular impact on Black and Brown youth is uh, the sort of framing of that question, which is that we always ask if the woman in prostitution has a right to sell her own body, or if the woman in prostitution has a right to sell sex. Uh, but who remains invisible by the framing of that question? 
we don't ask if wealthy men have the right to economically coerce poor and younger women into sex. We don't ask if the state or society has a right to push millions of us into poverty and then criminalize and arrest us for trying to survive it. And we don't ask if women and girls have a right to live in a society free from the commodification of our bodies and our sexualities. Um, and then the second thing, you know, to directly answer the question about the impact on Black and Brown youth is that, as I said earlier, since its inception, the sex trade has always targeted the most vulnerable in society. We see it's not the dominant groups in society doing this, it's the subordinated groups, the oppressed groups, the exploited groups that are doing it. And for Black and Brown youth who are targeted by traffickers, by pimps, to pretend that this is simply a result of their agency or their choice, which uh, I think some would be surprised how many people are pushing that narrative that you have underage black and brown youth who are doing this because of their choice. Uh, that argument really justifies violence against them violence against them at the hands of pimps and traffickers, but also the violence they experience at the hands of police and the state. And so we know from research that pimps see Black women, uh, young Black women in particular, as well as Indigenous women, uh, migrant women, as easier to exploit because they don't believe that society, the state, et cetera, cares about them as much as they might care about white women uh, or about women with a, a different sort of stature in society. So for example, um, you know, in reading the reports from Right for Girls, which uh, you know, is Yasmin's organization, we know that black children account for nearly 51% of all juvenile prostitution arrests more than any other racial group. And I think that this is a testament to the way that Black women and children are targeted both by the state, but also by exploitative actors like pimps and traffickers and sex buyers. Um, and this also applies to groups like LGBTQ youth of color who are often on the street, forced to hustle, forced to survive. And sex, male sex buyers, as well as pimps and traffickers, see this vulnerable position and they know that they could take advantage of it. Um, and, and so I think that in terms of how it affects the most vulnerable, that narrative merely justifies the exploitation and the violence that we're put through. Look, you know, if I was in church, I'd be like, well, because I think you just, <laughs> you, you, you hit all of it. You, you hit all of it. Um, my last question to you, Esperanza. Some would say that the presence of the prostitution system in and of itself reduces violence against women and children. What are your thoughts when you hear that, especially when we talk about women and children? And again, we're also being inclusive of, of all, but go ahead. Yeah, so the, the first thing I wanna say is that that is a frightening idea, right? That is a frightening idea to think that we need to have an institution like prostitution in order to prevent men from raping and trapping uh, and sometimes even killing women and children. And, and we need to be able to say explicitly that is a frightening idea, right? And, and we need to be uncomfortable with that. I think the idea that we need prostitution, pornography, et cetera, in order to prevent men from committing sexual violence against women and children is an idea that stems directly from rape culture. The first thing is that this idea does not hold true. Wherever pimping, brothel owning, and sex buying is legalized or decriminalized, violence against women in the sex trade either remains the same or increases. I read this story from a woman in New Zealand who was in prostitution before and after pimping, brothel owning, and sex buying was decriminalized. And she said, the violence against us remains the same because at the end of the day, who has the power? He does. He has the money. I don't. And so he's gonna push my boundaries to get what he wants at whatever expense or whatever means necessary. Um, the second thing, sorry, I just had one more thing. The second thing is that we need to challenge the fundamental patriarchal beliefs about men and sex that this idea is based upon. Men are not biologically or naturally prone to sexual violence or force. That is how society has constructed them. 
Also, there is no need for an institution of coerced women to service the needs of men. Women have been able to explore their sexual desires and needs without having an institution of economically coerced men to serve them. And then the last thing is that this idea is necessarily racist and it's necessarily misogynist and classist. Because when we say prostitution is necessary, what we're really saying is it's not women, it's not the white wealthy women that are going to be staffing it. It's the black and brown women, the poor women, the migrant women, the exploited women. And we're saying this is your place to serve men and let them take out all of their fantasies and violence on you so that we could stay safe. <laughs> Esperanza, you see me smiling and I kind of laugh because I'm telling you, am I laughing at you? You are so spot on. The way that you um, uh, articulate this whole thing, you know, it just... I'm just going like, yes. So Cheryl, Cheryl, you were exploited and sold uh, in your suburban community when you were a child. Isn't that totally different than what women experience as adults in the sex trade? And how does your lived experience relate to all of this? Yeah, so if you heard me discuss a little earlier, um, I was sold in a back room and porn was on in the front room as a lobby. Um, I was sold in a back of a car that wouldn't run because my trafficker was around my age. So there are clearly adults in this situation watching who are part of the sex industry and not doing anything about it. So as you can see that grooming procedure that would come toward me, the trauma bond, I would protect them. I stood up for them. I thought they were helping me get ahead in life um, because I was abused as a child. The amount um, of suffering that a child's brain goes through through sexual abuse changes them forever. Um, I every day have to remind myself that my pimp is not my best friend. I have two narratives running in my head all the time. Sometimes that narrative would drive me in high school to think I wanted to strip. Sometimes it would make me think I could meet up with a guy, have mutual consent and get paid. Um, I found out a few times how violent they were and was smart enough to realize I needed to step back and uh, graciously had friends in the sex industry who started to share the horrors of what they really endured. And that's what started to change my mind and help me understand I could go to college, I could get an education and, and fight for that. Um, and I was a teen pregnancy, 17-year-old um, girl. Um, so not that I haven't had any suffering in this, I just had more opportunities and a great support system to walk me through. But the sexual abuse as a child is what made me most vulnerable and that needs to be heard. The amount of sexual abuse in childhood for those who are in the sex industry is pretty high. Um, it, it's out there. So you're hearing a narrative that might have started much earlier in their youth. And I think it's important to always remember that, that when we hear stories today, even when we're servicing women, um, they have stories of sexual abuse as children. It really can create that trauma bond that lasts for a lifetime. And anyone in the sex, sex industry that I have met personally, we have relational trauma. Uh, we, we have intimacy issues. It's a struggle for us to trust um, and to even be present with ourselves. So there's a lot to consider when you enter the sex industry that's not being talked about. And as a parent, I have three daughters and I think it's for a reason, <laughs> but I am um, so protective of them because of the violence and harm that I did see through others and my own story. Um, if my child is going to be in high school um, hearing and, and being sexualized, we're already seeing the sexualization of children um, through Instagram, through posting. They're already thinking this is a good idea. So as we decriminalize traffickers, sex buyers, and brothel operators, we're already priming a great group of children for them to target. So this, this is connected. Uh, you can't just separate it easily. Uh, we are creating a um, almost a formula to increase child trafficking, where we're giving more power to the traffickers, buyers, and brothel operators. So the majority is still too much harm. There might be a small percentage of women who might be saying there's consent, even though the power is always going to be at the hands of the buyer. Um, my, my heart hurts 
to, to hear those things because of the safety issue um, and the risk of harm for children who will grow up in, in this generation. Um, this is history in the making. If we don't step up as survivors and honestly re-exploit our own stories, um, I, you know, I had to get up this morning and so did everyone else on this panel and say, I have to wake up and share my story, the most intimate parts of myself to help other people understand that there's more of us that you're not hearing from that need protection. So it's not really a call to action, it's a cry for help. Like we're here to step up for those survivors who aren't being heard. So maybe you have a voice and you have a privilege to be heard in your situation of working for the sex industry, but at some point we have to come together and say, yes, we don't want to um, you know, criminalize and, and harm people's stories who are survive, surviving in this, but on, it, on no behalf should we let off the hook an exploiter. It's just a, it's a hundred percent no for me and many survivors. You know, I, I, I love what you said about not a call to action, but a cry for help. And, and, and also when you start talking about the normalization, right, of when it comes to social media, um, those platforms that are out there that um, um, directly or indirectly uh, exasperate sexual exploitation, um, such as OnlyFans, because that's, that's another one that, um, that we're talking about that, that allows a platform for, and you talked about your children, um, that have the ability to put themselves at risk as it pertains to sexual exploitation um, and, and trafficking as well. And so now we're gonna take somewhat of a shift and we're gonna talk about Oregon a little bit. And we're gonna talk about the Northwest uh, Survivor Alliance. And so with that, we are now gonna bring on Robin Miller and Robin Miller is here with us. Robin is a, a case manager and an advocate in Vancouver, Washington, providing direct services to youth and young adults impacted by the commercial sex industry and trafficking. She is also a lived experience expert and survivor of commercial sexual exploitation through systems of prostitution. Robin, Tell us a little bit more and give us an update of what's going on in Oregon and tell us what is NWSA. Okay, thank you so much. I'm, I've been behind my uh, camera trying to be quiet, but then I realized I'd been on mute so I could do all the amens and the whoops and the um, snaps um, from uh, just in response to everything I've heard today. I'm just so thankful for all of the voices represented. And Northwest Survivor Alliance is a group of folks who are just like the people that have been presenting today. You know, we have this lived experience and we're facing something that's coming into our state. Um, Yasmin did um, a wonderful, gave a wonderful explanation about Oregon and its history. And um, I think we, you know, we call it, we came together. So uh, this, we can, we can stop it. This, uh, I think it was also mentioned that this came um, into our state from a sex work advocacy group out of, um, I think it might've been New York. So they have a lot of money and a lot of momentum. Um, we built the table um, because we have been kept out, out, out from tables. We haven't been invited, or if we do get invited, oftentimes we're at the kitty table, um, or we have a separate table that um, we can advise folks to. But what really pushed us to start uh, meeting and, and um, fighting this is that we have been now kept away from this table of people with lived experience who are saying that this, this will work, full decrim will work. Um, we we are excluded from these conversations, um, and we are we're ready to set the table and invite you all to um, to come to our table. So one of the ways that we're hoping to get some engagement and give you some more information and share with our state is that we're going to host an event on December seventh. Um, it's free to everybody, and it'll it'll be virtual. Um, we're going to have a, a, a lovely group of survivors and allies. Um, you'll see some faces on this that, that you see here today. Hopefully we'll be able to join us. Um, and so we're also like really uh, 
new to social media, and we're very excited to have this roll out. One of the ways that you can support us and get information and the word out into Oregon even is by liking and following us. So our handles are on the screen and they're also probably I'm going to be uh, dumped into the chat. We'd like you to follow us because even doing that will help us uh, raise awareness in our communities. Um, and there is a perk. So if you follow us in the next 24 hours, your name will be entered to win um, a set of books written by some a couple prominent survivors. And um, we'll do the drawing after the 24 hours has ended and you'll be notified it via Facebook or Instagram. Um, I was just, you know, I, I had all of these, I had like a very short time to talk. So um, I had all of these notes, what I wanted to share. And, and I'm so thankful that a lot of it was shared already. But one thing I just wanted to say is, you know, full decrim, this is the buyer's other happy ending right? Like this is exactly what they want. And this is not going to end well for us if this happens. So I just encourage you all to um, continue to learn and listen and pay attention. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, um, you know, as you were talking, I was just thinking about how this whole platform, it really embodies um, the need for us to support the survivor leaders and, 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 and what happens when they become the lead voice and, and the support that, that is needed. And before we close, we, we do have time for a few questions. And one question was, um, and, and this is going to be for, um, for everyone. Hold on. Everything was going really good until I started having to um, multitask. Um, someone was asking the question, which I thought was, was really good. And the question came early on. And, um, and, and by the way, you guys, through the, um, uh, the chat and the questions and answers that I'm looking at, um, they all think that you are so phenomenal. And so one of the questions kind of deals with when we're dealing with the youth, you know, um, that are out there and they're struggling and they're trying to come up with ways to survive. What are some of your suggestions that to the youth that might be out there that are struggling or for those that are um, working with the youth? What are some of your, what do you guys suggest? And just, you know, just make sure you just quickly open up your mic and, 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 and speak to that. So um, I, I just like to talk to this just really fast. I, uh, I respect and, and acknowledge this question. And also I just kind of want to acknowledge one additional thing to this. We have a tendency, especially within the anti-trafficking unit uh, uh, movement of talking about kids um, and kids alone. Like uh, the, you can only experience harm if you are a youth. And I think it's really important to point out that, you know, <laughs> just because you turn 18 doesn't mean the trauma goes away. It doesn't mean the violence goes away. It doesn't mean that third party goes away. It doesn't mean poverty goes away. You know, it doesn't mean that um, anything is, is any less violent or less terrible. Um, I think I've worked at a previously a direct service organization that helped people uh, who were in prostitution and we served anyone of any age. And our youngest person we ever served was 11 and the oldest was 84. Um, the reality is we need services that go past youth. Um, I think it's important to focus on youth in this conversation, but I also just want to acknowledge that nothing magical happens on the 18th birthday. And if we, you know people are serving other people who are 84 years old, who've been out of life for 30 years, that says something about the long lasting impacts of this trauma. So sorry, I recognize that was not the question and also just had to say that, so. Does anybody else wanna tackle that question in terms of how do we help our youth that are out there struggling so that they don't have to um, rely on selling their bodies? I could say something, I guess. Um, I work with youth. So, you know, the best thing I found um, that I can do is show up show up and try to support them where they're at, meet their basic needs. Um, make sure, you know, if, if they're not safe, that we find ways to help them 
find safety. Um, this isn't easy. You can't also force or or save a 12 year old out of the life. They have to also, you know, walk along and, and make those decisions. And that's one of the hardest things that I found in serving youth is um, letting their own agency kind of um, direct the way that we work with them. And I think that's also like you give them the ability to tell you what you, what they need, right? And, and you show up for them and you connect them with safe adults. And if you're not the person that they're connecting with, that they that they vibe with or, you know, whatever, you find somebody who can and who will. Um, you build collaboration in your communities and you just make sure to get them all wrap around. So that's the best answer I can give. <laughs> You know, and I'm just going to add to that just a little bit is you got to stay with them. You know, even if they leave your organization and they come back, you got to embrace them. You got to stay with them. And, and, you know, I think that that helps. And then, of course, you know, organizations need money. They need money to be able to help um, the youth be on their way. But by the fact that you even have an organization for them to go to is a start. Does anybody want to add to that or shall I continue on to the next question? Okay, next question. And this is up for grabs. Do you think that outlets like OnlyFans promotes human trafficking? What do you guys think? I would say um, human trafficking promotes OnlyFans. Um, you know, it, it's all absorbed into the same direction of marketing if you're going to look at it from a business perspective. So, um, you know, human trafficking is, they're, they're masters at marketing. They're, they're master manipulators. Um, so they'll use any platform they can, right, to, to exploit people. Um, and OnlyFans is a, a really good bargain for for them. Um, and it's also a very slippery slope for those who might choose to go on there independently um, and, and try to find a way to stay independent without coming across someone who may come off as nice, but will end up, um, you know, exploiting you in the end or having you engage in, um, you know, pictures and threats and coercion. Um, it, it's all high risk and OnlyFans is not doing, you know, the, their, their job of you know, really monitoring the way they the way they should with CSAM and things like that. So it, it's a very, I would say, a messy answer and question. Um, and there's a lot of research that I feel like Stephanie, you could probably answer it if I'm honest. <laughs> um, but I definitely <laughs> want to point good. out that human trafficking definitely uses only fans. I don't, you know, there might not. I don't want to put in someone's mouth that only fans that that's why they started it. Um, but there sure is a connection because human trafficking will, will utilize that 100%. Well, it does, definitely puts them out there and, and at risk, right, for um, a, a trafficker to be able to try and, and, and pull them in. Uh, did, did somebody else want to add to that? Okay, next question. This person says, I have recently become an advocate for adult survivors. And while they have been um, great at communicating their needs to me, they are still in the middle of the trauma and trying to get to where um, you guys are. What advice would you want to give to the survivors so that they can continue to do this work? What do you guys think? Hey, Robin, you want to take this with me? Sure, I will try. <laughs> I will follow your lead. <laughs> so I asked Robin to take this with me because Robin and I have worked with each other for a very long time. And um, we, I was actually a part of NDWSA when it first started um, and uh, helped guide some of the beginning principles of it. And um, first thing I'll say is if it's not safe, you should not be doing this. Uh, you know, check with yourself, make sure that your safety is at a good place. But Robin, do you think that community with survivors is the thing that really helps with this? Like community with other survivors, sitting in a circle with other survivors? Is that absolutely, the thing that gives absolutely. It? yes, absolutely. I will say I worked, you know, um, when I came out of the life, uh, 
you know, I also, I, I hold some privilege. I hold a lot of privilege. And so I came out of the light back to a family who supported me and all of that. And, and it was still, it's still been hard. This is the, everything about this issue is the long game, right? Like it's a long game. A, a trafficker's got a long time to wait to groom somebody. And we have to be able to spend as much time um, building ourselves up as well as our, our, our siblings in this movement. Um, until I found my group um, of siblings who started saying the same things that happened to like what happened to them happened to me. Um, up until then, I thought I was alone. I thought I believe there's uh, a statistic they used to quote, and I don't think it's founded, but like the average life expectancy of somebody in, in um, prostitution is um, seven years. And I had gotten out in six, so I thought everybody was dead. And so when I found my, my, my people, that's when my life changed. And that's when I started um, building confidence. Um, opportunities showed up. It was, it was other survivors bringing them to me. It wasn't um, other systems or uh, service providers. It was, it was the people that had the same experience that I had. I just wanted to pull you into that because I recognize that when you and I were first doing this work, it was really important that we had Sister, sisterhood yeah. and survivorship in that so thank you thank you thank you guys so much and I hope that helps that person that is starting to get into this because I think there's going to be other people that uh have those same questions as well last question um there are a few that are you know amongst us and when it comes to friends of yours that support Black Lives Matter and women's rights, what would you say to convince them about your perspective? Yasmin, you wanna take that one? Or do you guys just jump in there? Sure, I think there was one of the questions uh, in, in the Q&A was about that, about, um, you know, advocates nowadays who are kind of buying into the my body, my choice rhetoric and, you know, the whole mantra around quote unquote sex work is work. And they believe that that is compatible with some of the other social justice or progressive social justice causes of the day, like supporting Black Lives Matter and missing and murdered uh, indigenous women. Um, and I would just say that, you know, continue to listen to survivors and those who are impacted uh, by the sex trade and to really understand the origins of the sex trade and how it's connected to sex trafficking in the United States uh, and elsewhere throughout the world, right? Um, or start with your state of Oregon, just understand the history, understand who's disproportionately impacted, understand um, what prostitution and the sex trade actually entails. Uh, if you can, you know, follow more survivors on social media, read their works. I mean, many of the survivors on this panel have written brilliant articles and thought pieces around these issues um, and have an excellent framing and analysis. Um, they're survivors from other countries, right? New Zealand, Sabrina Valise has written extensively about this. They're survivors from Germany uh, and the Netherlands and other places who talk about the horrors of legalization and full decriminalization in, in their states. And so I think understanding what it actually entails and trying to see past like media presentations or um, you know, some of the mainstream narratives that aren't actually representative of what a life in the sex industry actually entails um, can be very helpful to informing your position. And I think um, you know, the, the other important thing to realize is you know, we may be hearing some of the loudest voices, but understanding that they may be some of the more privileged voices, right? And so when we create public policy, we don't center the handful of the most privileged, right? We, we center the most marginalized, the most vulnerable, those who actually um, want out and you know, are, are truly uh, looking for ways out of this life and, and this industry. And so I think that's who we center. Um, I know certainly that that's our mantra at Rights for Girls. We create policies centering our most marginalized girls because we believe that when their needs are met, it follows that everyone else in society's needs are met. And so that's kind of our guiding star. Um, and I would just encourage you to just educate yourself more on these issues. Yes, and, and I agree with you, especially when you talk about um, listening to the survivors. And when you look at um, who is disproportionately victims of, of human trafficking. And then I think we have to be very careful 
because sometimes what happens is that what I see is the hijacking of um, civil rights and social justice, the, the hijacking of that and of that pain in order to elevate the agendas of others that have nothing to do with what is really best for the community, right? And so being very careful of that, because when we look at the inherent dangers, when we look at the trauma, when, when people who are the advocates that work directly with victims of human trafficking, and you're trying to put together back those pieces, right? When you know that, and when that person looks like you, how can you say that that is the best for them? And so I, I totally agree. And it's something that we have to be very cognizant of. And I really appreciate that question. I also appreciate all of you today that have attended. And I appreciate this panel. I have loved working with you. And so with that, I'm going to shift it back to Cheryl to be able to close us out. And thank you so much, Cheryl, for putting us all together. Yes, and just to help with that question, please join us on December 7th with the NWSA event. If you are a survivor, we're seeing things come in where you don't know how to share your story and stay safe right now today. Um, I would just like to be the witness to say that's coming in right now. What we're saying is true. Uh, we have survivors on the call saying, how do I get my story out there and not um, become at risk of retaliation of my trafficker? Um, please email us at northwestsurvivoralliance at gmail.com. It's nwsurvivoralliance at gmail.com. Um, come to that table. If you want to be an ally, if you're still learning, um, join us on December 7th. And uh, starting today, uh, if you want to follow us on any of those, please remember there will be a book prize from a prominent survivor leader uh, that we will send to you. So we want you to support survivors taking the lead. If you're an organization, this is your call to action to listen to survivors and join us at NWSA. Um, I think it was brought up earlier that part of the reason I have been able to share my story through in our backyard because I felt safe around that community of leadership. Um, it does matter who's around you. But in this particular topic, I don't know if I could ever um, really speak about this topic and proposed agenda until I met the other survivors of NWSA. So it community matters 100%. Um, so I can't um, shout that out enough. And that's the, I think that's the only reason um, you'll always smile. Um, I have a smile on my face, uh, you know, for the overcoming. Of, of pain and, and harm. Um, we, we don't do this work um, to stay scared, right? We do it in strength together. So we wanna thank everyone for being here. Um, Oregon, I, I am living there now. Um, let's rally, let's get together. Let us know what you think, what you feel. Um, if you're on this call and you are in the a place of um, like legislative leadership, if you haven't heard from us yet, we welcome you to meet with us. We are, we are open and we are positive and we want to bring a positive impact to Oregon. Um, we are not drugs to sell. Um, so please hear our voice in that fight. Um, locally, we are going to be there with you along the whole way. Nationally, this is your first um, call out to action to start researching and reach out to any of us. Um, Stephanie is wonderful. World We is wonderful. You can go to the equalitymodel.us um, website and learn more about it. But this is the time to say this is really happening. This isn't um, you know, way in the future or way back when. I don't know which direction to think this has gone really, um, but we need to start learning about what's happening in your state because this is already in the talks and works of being passed. And we have to understand there are four groups. There's the body, there's the buyer, there's the trafficker, and there's the brothel we cannot criminalize the body. We have to do better and we're all in agreement of that. But the other three categories of exploiters, we're holding accountable. And I hope you can walk away understanding that that's what we're fighting for. We are fighting for the marginalized, we are fighting for the vulnerable, and we are fighting for the children and every adult survivor and young adult survivor in the industry and speaking 
not on their behalf by choice, um, but because there are people on this call with the courage to stand up and say something. So on behalf of In Our Backyard, Dr. Stephanie Powell, thank you for representing Nicosi so well and protecting our voices as a big mama on the call sometimes. <laughs> I just love you and I love moms in my life and, and you're a mom. Um, thank you so much. And um, World We with Lauren Hirsch, we are so appreciative that this type of platform was a much bigger table than the NWSA ever expected. And it's because allies are coming behind us and letting survivors lead. So thank you for um, Yasmin and Esperanza and Elisa, um, Rights for Girls, Thistle Farms. Um, this could not be possible without you. So get to know these organizations and join and stand with survivors. Thank you again for your time and we'll see you soon.